What's up everybody, my name is Michael Gardner. In today's video, we are interviewing Paulo, the founder of Giletti Advertising. Paulo, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So for a bit of context, Paulo actually initially joined Felipe and I's training program, B2B Outbound. This was a few months ago, actually the first person to join. We got on really well with Paulo and said, hey man, come hang out with us in Thailand. Paulo, you came here for two weeks and how long have you been here now? It's been five months now. Five months, so that's pretty crazy. So we wanted to do this intro in person. We'll hop into Zoom, but it's to show that the relationships you make online in the business world, it's cool to see them materialize, and um, it's been cool having you traveling around with us, Paulo. Absolutely, looking forward. All right, let's get into the Zoom. And back again on Zoom, you just had the in-person intro with Mr. Paulo, but now we have time to actually tear down Paulo's business and see how we got to where he is. So Paulo, ready to get into it? Let's do it. Nice. So one thing to note for everybody listening is Paulo is a baby. Paulo's 19. I started really young. I started when I was 15. So I relate to Paulo a lot in that way. And uh, Paulo surpassed the ranks of where most people will ever get to at such a young age. Uh, the first question for you, Paulo, is what got you into this when you were really young? Obviously, there must have been some type of spark, initial interest, YouTube video, mentor. What was it? Good question, man. Um, yeah, it always started uh, back in high school. I remember very clearly. Um, I was into entrepreneurship. Started watching some YouTube content. Uh, some uh, we had, uh, I think, the same kind of gurus back then. Uh, and at some point in high school, we had this uh, big keynote, um, which is uh, was from someone that had a company. A big keynote in in, in business entrepreneurship and how to start a business from school. And then I ended up going to stage and talking to this guy. His name is Danilo. Uh, I'm originally uh, based in Brazil. I'm, I was born in Brazil. Uh, and uh, back then, uh, I started creating a relationship with him, started to talk to him, started to follow him around a little bit. And he kind of got me into this world of trying to make some money while I was in high school. And uh, luckily, this was kind of the same time uh, as uh, when uh, COVID kind of started and that was when I had some free time from school because I couldn't go there so that meant I could stay and and pretty much be on my computer the whole day trying to figure out these little projects build websites here and do these little things for money uh, online so that's that's I think how how everything started back then I was same as you 15 16 uh, and now uh, four years after I'm, I'm 19 years old nice man and what was the first business that you tried out well, there was a couple of small things. Uh, one one I remember was I uh, started like an affiliate marketing uh, with Amazon, uh, like the, the affiliate links, trying to sell books with uh, Facebook ads. So I started doing Facebook ads and then uh, running them to Amazon never worked. Also doing some video editing uh, on freelancing platforms. Uh, and then when I started actually taking it more seriously, spending more time trying to create a business, uh, I started doing some content creation for some brands, but starting uh, with a supplement brand, which funnily enough is now our main focus, uh, which we are going to get on, get to in a second, uh, but also uh, creating content for these small businesses, um, salad bowl places and coffee shops back in Brazil, which uh, paid very little. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny when, uh, when we remember when you compare how much we were making uh, back then. But for, for me, it was a, a lot of experience, just taking pictures, editing, sending back and managing social media, this and that. So that would be the, the first first uh, peek into entrepreneurship. Awesome. Thanks for the background. And one thing that I want to highlight there, and this is a, something I hear a lot, is how can I charge a lot? I'm based in X. You know, I'm based in India, I'm based in Pakistan, Brazil, I'm based in, even I hear this in like random European countries, uh, there's like this preconceived notion that people are going to hold where you're based to your price. And um, you mentioned that you're doing work for local businesses, obviously getting paid in Brazilian real, uh, it's be a lower amount. What was that first transition from, wait, I'm equally as valuable on an international market as I am on a local market? How did you first decide that? How did you first transition? Oh, great, great question. Uh, it was very interesting. I was working, doing Facebook ads back then for uh, brands uh, in Brazil. And the retainers were, were, were all in real, which is the Brazilian currency. And then this mentor I mentioned back then from, from the school keynote, he, he came up to me and said, you know how to speak English um, uh, you know, uh, to some extent. You should charge in dollars. It's, it's five times the Brazilian currency and you can charge the same amount, but in dollars, which makes much more sense. So initially I was like, mm, I would never get uh, 
they never take me seriously. I'm from Brazil. I, my English was um, still not perfect, but back then was 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 worse. And uh, back then, uh, I I just uh, tried. I started tr sending emails, cold emails in English for uh, uh, brands in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and so on. And one guy after three months of uh, hundreds of emails took me uh, on for a call. Uh, he accepted to have a call with me. And then I scripted the whole thing. I remember each question, every question I had was very, uh, I, I planned it, I, I practiced it. And if anything went out of the script, I would be uh, screwed back then. But uh, but it actually uh, worked well. So the, the, this first sales call with an American business, I ended up closing for a retainer of 1200, I remember. And that was the first step towards uh, getting to the global market. The, this client was originally based in New York. It was a fashion brand based in New York. And from there, I said, okay, that makes that does make sense. Let's just go after uh, businesses outside of Brazil in dollars, pounds, uh, euros. And it's fun because uh, most of them actually, after being in, in at this point, dozens of sales call sales calls. Uh, most of them, when when they ask where are you from, they uh, I'll say, oh, I'm from Brazil, and they will actually uh, be happy about it. They'll actually be okay. That's that's great. I've been there for carnival, or I've been there with my family, or uh, they they like it because they know that our costs uh, for employees and our uh, costs to operate the business are much uh, um, are, are lower than if we were in the US, for example. So our retainers also reflect a little bit of that. All the money go actually into uh, not fancy offices in the UK or fancy offices in the US, but actually towards uh, fulfillment and actually towards talent that will deliver a better service. So it ends up uh, working pretty well. Thanks for the explanation. I, I think that's actually really helpful for a lot of people listening because it is something I hear over and over again that, you know, this won't work for me. I'm based from X, Y, and Z. I mean, if you don't tell someone you're based in Brazil, no one's going to have any idea. I mean, look at Miami, man. I mean, like, yeah, I'm in Miami. Uh, you know, there's literally no no issues there. So well, one other question tying into obviously being young in business, and I'm I'm addressing this specifically because a lot of the interviews I do, or if guys that are in their late 20s, 30s, sometimes even 40s, um, you know, family tied into business is less of a topic for them, or it's more like I have kids, how I manage them. Uh, but for yourself, what was the point where your parents kind of started taking what you were doing as, okay, it's not just him messing around, he's actually making some significant income? Where was that point? Well, um, that came with a lot of uh, resistance from them, especially when I was not making anything you know, in the, the, the initial gap. When uh, you know I'm just doing this, this all this work and not really seeing a big return. That's the the initial phase. The, I'd say the first year in business for most people will be like that. Uh, and in that phase, it's really hard. They say no, just focus on school, just do this, just just keep your normal path. But then once you we you start getting results. So for me, that was when I think I started closing these international clients. First, I I communicated a lot with them, so I. Talk to them, hey, look what I'm doing for this brand. Look, this sales call I had. When one thing that was interesting, the first sales call I showed to my, my dad, I was actually very proud because first I was talking, uh, speaking in English, which is something that for them is like, okay, uh, that that's uh, that's good. And also, uh, he seen me talking to another business owner. And for them, for our parents, most of the times they say, oh, they are young, they, they can't. Uh, they're not ready for, for business world, for work. They should go to college first. But then when they see us um, actually speaking to a business owner and closing a deal, receiving money from them and actually starting to make some money out of this business, then that's the point where they start to respect. So for me, I started uh, not asking them for money anymore. I started paying my own bills. I started helping them even with some things uh, um, in the house. I think I was 15 when I bought them their first dinner. So I ordered this very fancy Japanese uh, meal at home and then it was all on me. So that's, that's I think, is when uh, uh, they, they really start to respect and understand. That's awesome. Now, that's a cool story. And I like how you have that one core moment of a Japanese dinner. That's probably something that you'll tell at a seminar or, um, or at many other podcasts in the future. So transitioning from the personal stuff to the business stuff now, um, obviously you do Google Ads. Um, I'm curious, when you first started, did you go down the path of we do everything for everybody or was Google Ads the first thing that you latched on to? Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, in the beginning, uh, we 
mainly focused on paid traffic. And back then, Facebook ads was really trending. So that was the first platform where uh, I really put in time to learn, to really understand all the, all the, all, all our sales was around, but we do your Facebook advertising. Uh, but outside of that, also, uh, we'd offer graphic design and some other things just to try to get the client, which now, uh, a few years later, I, I see that it's not a good idea to, to, to broaden up too much this service offering. So um, that's it. that's how it started with Facebook advertising. Then we also did some email advertising at some point. And then about two years ago, two and a half years ago, that's when we decided to go all in on Google Ads. So we were seeing that for most brands, e-commerce brands, of uh, Google Ads is the most consistent and reliable and scalable platform. So we decided to simply become the absolute best in Google Ads and focus just on that for, for clients. Awesome. Thank you for the explanation. And we talk about getting specific on Google ads, but I know you've also gotten specific on working with supplement companies. I know not exclusively, but majority of your clients being supplement brands. And I've seen firsthand how that's really impacted your campaigns because you just have all this credibility and social proof. Was that on accident you stumbled into that space or was that intentional? It was actually uh, an accident. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, at some point I realized that 75% of our clients were in the supplement space, probably because I think we we, we did a, a, a whole outreach uh, um, effort around supplements, part of our learn from you in code email, and then had all this very well segmented uh, email script around supplements. And we started to close more and more supplement brands. And now it's, it's fun because we uh, kind of by accident, we have the biggest creatine brand in the US, the number one creatine rated in the US. Also, one of the top 10 isolate whey protein brands. And now we are about to start working with the biggest pre-workout brand in the US, which is very interesting. That just happened to happen that way. And uh, now we'll pretty much niche down and start focusing more and more on supplements, which is where we already understand the nuances. We already understand how to uh, do the the, the Google ads in a way where it makes more sense specifically for this niche. The mathematics behind it, all the math is very, uh, is very unique. So we, we have been uh, specializing on, on supplements and uh, accidentally became a, a very good Google ads agency for supplement brands specifically. That's great. And um, I, I like how you mentioned that, you know, you're segmenting your campaigns around supplements. Obviously, one of the things we're big on teaching in B2B Outbound, and that's for anybody listening, that's the program where uh, me and Paulo originally got close. Uh, it's a coaching program I run with his partner, Felipe. We talk a lot about segmenting, right? Um, your campaigns are only as good as how specific you're targeting. You know, uh, beauty brands don't care about supplement case studies and, and vice versa. So Paulo taking that advice and doing those very specific um, supplement campaigns, it just puts them as a position of an expert. And um I'm curious if you could have noticed a difference between when you do a generic campaign versus when you do like one of these niche campaigns around case studies. I also have found that like the actual sales process is a lot different because people just look at you like the expert as opposed to a generalist. Exactly. And and, and yeah, as you said, in the uh, during the, the whole sales process, so first in the emails, you get a lot more people uh, replying naturally as they will not only read your email and see your case studies, but also click on your website. Now I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of building a whole landing page around supplements to really build social proof. But for example, on the brands you, you work with section, I have a bunch of supplement brands. So they look at the website and then they come back to the email and they reply positively like, hey, great, I saw this brand. Uh, Funnily enough, I had a, a consulting call a couple of weeks back and the owner said, hey, I only booked this, this consulting call because I saw that you are working with this brand and I'm actually mm -hmm. friends with the owner. Uh, so in, in e-commerce and I think in, in business in general, uh, a lot of people, uh, there's, a, there's a community around the, the, the highest performing businesses so around the highest performing supplement brands. You have a lot of people knowing each other. And then uh, they see uh, someone else's brand that they know of. Um, for uh, they look at the brands you work with, and they go, "Okay, great, this guy works with him. I will either ask for a recommendation for for their opinion, or I will just book a call." And 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 then after on the sales call itself, after you book the call, uh, you can leverage the, the 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 case studies, and and you can do the selling simply by um, 
saying, okay, we, we did this for this brand and this for this brand and we work with this brand and that will actually be a brand that they have been looking, uh, uh, they, they are competing against on Amazon, for example, or they are uh, uh, looking at it as an inspiration. So then when you say, yeah, we've been we're doing this, this and this for them, they're just, okay, no brainer. These guys know what they are doing. Uh, you don't have to, to prove again and again that you have experience and that you deliver good results because you simply show those those other projects. Love it. I agree with everything you're saying. And now uh, tying down to the end of the interview here, um, one thing I've noticed with you is that you have a very nicely calculated risk tolerance. I see some people where they're off the walls. I see other people where we're terrified to take risks. Um, one of those being, um, for anybody who doesn't know, I, I work with Felipe as my business partner for my agency and for our coaching program. And we had actually invited Paulo uh, to come um, well, initially meet us in Brazil when you're traveling there. And, uh, and upon meeting Paul in Brazil, he was insistent that traveling is not for him and he's just going to stay here and do a whole bunch of boring stuff. Um, and then uh, in, in Thailand, uh, Felipe and I said, Paulo, you should come out here. And um, and this is, I think you were one week into university or two weeks into university and uh, you made the decision to drop that and come here. What was the changing factor between the six month period we had met in Brazil, where you were going to get the whole picket fence and settle down compared to now being indefinitely moving around? Well, that's that that was an interesting phase in my life. Uh, we, we initially met in Brazil uh, about more than a year ago, and then I received the invitation, right? Well, let's go to Thailand. I was like, mm, Thailand, the other side of the world is quite a scary idea for me back then. And I had a college coming up. I started to college for some reason back then. I kind of accepted the idea of let's let's do this while I run the business, which is something that's just not a good idea in my opinion anymore. And then I was like, okay, I have too much stuff. I have college coming up. I have this. Now let's just stay in Brazil and keep my routine going. And then I think I went to college and then I saw after six months there, after uh, uh, seven months there, actually, that that wasn't for me. That doesn't make sense. And then that's when I, I messaged Michael, say, hey, uh, is that an invitation to go to Thailand still open? Uh, uh, and then he said, yes, it's still open. Uh, you can you can come in in October. And then uh, I decided to drop out. That was after a couple of, of weeks in, in, in college, uh, in the se second semester, actually, of college. And uh, I just just booked the flight and, and came, came here. So it's very, very interesting experience. Uh, definitely uh, before I had this 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 risk uh, uh, tolerance, as I mentioned before, also for business, right? Like I was, okay, I, I, here in Brazil, I have my routine. I have everything taken care of. I can just the business i don't have to worry about anything else and then the idea was uh, this is helping me this is giving me more time to dedicate on the business and now uh, if i start traveling i may lose productivity this and that but I, what i realized after being here for uh, as i mentioned five five months is that uh, the, the the actual productivity the actual outcome of the work even let's say i'm, I'm putting one hour less into work every day the, the output of the work has been much better than uh, before, simply because I, I, there's something about uh, seeing new places and something about it. there's some energy that is acquired by a seeing new place and getting to know new cultures and doing new uh, uh, stuff on the free time that uh, fuels you up for business. So yeah, that's that's a very, very interesting story there. That's a very good way to summarize it. And I, I do agree that you see new things, you realize how much there is, and it makes you want to do more so you can experience more of it. Well, Paulo, this interview has been great. I appreciate you coming on. I will have Paulo's links down below if you want to follow him on YouTube and also link to his agency. If you have a referral or you're an econ founder, you want to talk to Paulo about Google Ads, I encourage you to uh, check out his website and book a call. Uh, Paulo, thanks for coming on. That's great, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.